And welcome to this edition of the Native News Update on this uh, Wednesday, August 15th. I am your host for today's program, Paul Domain, and many of the stories we uh, read here can also be found at our website, IndianCountryNews.com, and here are some of those news stories for the day from the Associated Press and other Native News sources. The Obama administration on August 13 began reaching out to Native American political and spiritual leaders to address concerns over the protection of sacred sites on federal land. About four dozen tribal leaders from New Mexico, Arizona, and elsewhere packed a meeting room in Albuquerque for the first of a few listening sessions planned by the U.S. Interior Department. Pointing to the importance of sacred sites to religious and cultural practices, the department is aiming to develop some kind of uniform policy for addressing the protection of such sites. That could mean a consultation policy specific to uh, sacred sites or changes in the law that would allow for greater protections, according to officials. Dion Kilsback, a counselor to the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs, acknowledging that developing a policy for addressing sacred sites is uh, made even more difficult given the secrecy surrounding many Native religious and cultural practices. Meetings on sacred sites are also planned later this month in Montana, in Minnesota at Fort Snelling on August 23rd, and later on in Connecticut. We Wins, or Women Empowering Women for Indian Nation's 8th Annual Conference is quickly approaching, and they're planning to honor Winona LaDuke, Ada Deer, Margot Gray Proctor, Arlene Wias, and the late Eloise Cobell. Their life achievements will be highlighted during the honoring luncheon on August 22nd at Mystic Lake Casino and Hotel in Prior Lake, Minnesota. LaDuke is an Anishinaabe Kwe woman, enrolled member of the Mississippi Band of Ojibwe Anishinaabe. She's a mother of three, an activist, environmentalist, economist, and prolific writer. LaDuke has devoted her life to protecting native lands and lifeways. Ada Deer, a member of the Menominee tribe and all kinds of first, including the first woman to head up the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Margot Gray Proctor, a citizen of the Osage Nation and is a dynamic third generation entrepreneur. Arlene Wias is a member of the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. She is a founder of the Mille Lacs Community Healing Project, a grassroots initiative formed by community members following a series of tragedies, including the untimely passing of her son and then the late Eloise Cobell, Blackfeet, who worked tirelessly uh, with administration after administration to bring justice to thousands of individual Indian money account holders. And those payments are gonna start soon. And by the way, those ladies had very, very lengthy resumes to read off. So that's coming up on August 22nd at Mystic Lake. Tom R. Viso, publisher and chief executive officer of the Navajo Times in Window Rock, Arizona, the largest Native American newspaper published in the United States and Canada, and James Mallory, recently retired senior managing editor and vice president of news at the Atlantic Journal-Constitution, are the recipients of the 11th annual Robert G. Magruder Award for Diversity Leadership, awarded by the Associated Press Media Editors. The Magruder Award for Diversity Leadership is given annually to individuals, newsrooms, or teams of journalists who embody the spirit of Magruder, a former executive editor of the De Detroit Free Press. This year, the 11th Annual Awards were sponsored by the Detroit Free Press, The Plain Dealer, Kent State University, and the Freedom Forum. The winners will be recognized Thursday, September 20th at the annual APME Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. The honorees will each receive $2,500 in a leadership plaque. Our Viso and Mallory were honored for their long-standing commitment to diversity in newspaper content and in newsroom recruiting and staff development. South Carolina parents Matt and Melanie uh, Capo Bianco, who adopted a Native American girl, have asked a high court to reconsider its decision to send her back to Oklahoma. Court officials confirmed that the adoptive uh, parents uh, last week asked the South Carolina Supreme Court to rehear the case. Last month, the court voted 3-2 to two to return the now two-year-old girl, Veronica, to her biological father, Dustin Brown, in uh, Oklahoma. In its first uh, decision weighing state adoption law against the Federal Indian Child Welfare Act, the court wrote that the federal law gives custodial preference to the girl's father, a member of the Cherokee Nation. No further details about when the court would decide if it would rehear 
the case, or when they'll rehear that case. Cherokee Nation tribal councilors voted 9 to 8 August 13th to require key executive leadership positions to be held by Cherokee citizens. The positions include General Consul, Chief of Staff, Communications Director, Government Relations Director, and Chief Executive Officer of the Cherokee Nation Businesses. Chief Baker vowed to veto the legislation after he heard from and cited the Cherokee Nation Attorney General's opinion that the legislation violates the Cherokee Nation Constitution. District 4 Tribal Con Counselor Dick Lay of Ochilata sponsored the bill, saying the intent is to ensure that powerful tribal positions serve the best interest of the Cherokee citizens. In addition to the issue of constitutionality, dissenting counselors also cited concerns beyond the Cherokee Nation's boundaries. A federal judge says a North Dakota man convicted of operating a drug and prostitution ring on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation must serve 45 years in prison. A jury in April found Dustin Moore said of Newtown guilty on several charges including sex trafficking, sexual abuse, drug trafficking, and witness tampering. Morissette faced a maximum sentence of life in prison without parole. Judge Daniel Hovland says Morissette deserved a stiff sentence, but says a life sentence is harsh for a 23-year-old man with no criminal history, a childhood spent living in 21 different foster homes, and a life plagued with dysfunction and chaos. A fire ban in Trona County, Wyoming will not stop a weekly Native American spiritual ceremony. Participants in the ceremony and county officials worked out a solution that allows a, a fire to be part of the services by stationing a county-owned fire truck beside the sweat lodge where the ceremony is held each Sunday. The sweat lodge is located at Steve Weber's home near Edna's K. Wilkins State Park east of Casper. Firefighters responded to a report of smoke at Weber's property recently and found a group participating in the American Indian Spiritual Ceremony. Weber says fire is a necessary part of the religious ceremony. In order to get those rocks hot enough, Weber tells the Casper Star Tribune that he's really thankful that a quick solution was found. The remains of an Oglala Lakota citizen member who passed away in Connect Connecticut while touring New England with Buffalo Bill's Rough Riders 112 years ago are being returned to South Dakota. The News Times of Danbury reports Albert Afraid of Hawk uh, passed away at age 20 from food poisoning. His remains have been buried in an unmarked grave at a Danbury, Connecticut cemetery. Several members of uh, Afraid of Hawk's family, including a nephew and grandniece, plan to arrive in Danbury later this month from South Dakota for a private ceremony that includes the disinterment of their relatives' remains. Robert Young of the Danbury Museum and Historical Society contacted the Pine Ridge Burial Assistance Office, which helped him find a freight of Hawk's family, and he traveled to South Dakota to meet with them. And that's going to be another roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Native News Update. We want to say wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah